Americans, we Americans love to build. And our church cornerstones bear witness to our long history of building. The 1887 cornerstone came from our very first building known as Prospect Methodist Episcopal Church. It was built on land donated by William Ray and his wife, Rachel Gardner Ray. The Prospect Church was a one room building heated in the winter by a pot-bellied stove on either side and cooled in the summer by a breeze that hopefully came through the open, plain glass windows. The second cornerstone of 1924 was the result of a merger, a merger between us, our sister church, Sulphur Springs, which is would have been located on the land that is now Fort Meade. But as the government took that land, they needed a new place to be. And so Prospect Church was torn down and the new Severn Church emerged with our stained glass windows. In 1960, our third cornerstone was added. That is when we gained indoor toilets. 1960. We finally got indoor toilets along with the back Sunday school rooms the fireplace room downstairs, changes to the fellowship hall, and our expanded new sanctuary. We continue to build. We've put a new roof on this building and we've made plans to improve our Sunday school rooms so that we can have a clean and safe place for the children to learn in. Our house for God gives us shelter from the bitterness, it cold in the winter, and from the extreme heat in the sun and humidity in the summer. It gives us a comfortable place to learn and engage in ministry in. It is for us a place of consistency we come each week, a place that we find rest and peace. We are grateful to all of those who have built it. David shared our desire to build. David, the shepherd boy who became a prince, the tenacious warrior who became a king, built himself a house of cedar, sat in it, and paused to think. And he reflected on how he felt God's presence and power with him throughout his life. And yet he lived in a mansion, and the ark was housed in a tent. And he had that desire to give back. He decided to build a house for God. And Nathan, his pastor, thought this was a great idea until he slept on it. And God redirected those construction plans. God did not grant David the building permit. Instead, he promised to build David a house. I just love that wordplay that the Bible uses right there. David wanted to build a house, a dwelling, a temple, a permanent structure to God. And God wants to build David a house, a dynasty, generations on generations on generations, stretching into the future further than David could possibly imagine. God's not ready for David's concept of a house. God has been moving in and amongst all the people, tenting with them on their nomadic journey out of Egypt. God has been right beside them through all their trials. And at this point, it's not about what David can do for God, but about what God is going to do through David. God's going to provide a place for the Israelites to be planted and to flourish to enjoy safety and security. He's going to provide both a homeland and some dwellings. And God promises never to take God's love away from the seed of David. Later, Solomon, David's son, will build a house for God, a temple for worship. But that comes much later. Theologian Walter Brueggemann suggests that God's house building is important for two reasons. First, 
It's the taproot of the messianic thought in the Old Testament. This is where we begin to hope for a future divinic king of salvation. Christians understand this promise as the promise that leads to Jesus' eternal kingdom. And that's why Matthew begins his book with gene the genealogy of Jesus, listing all of the generations from Abraham to David, and from David to Jokiah, and from the, at the period of exile to Babylon, and finally from the return of the exile all the way down to Joseph and Mary and Jesus. The second reason that God's house building is important is that it is a promise of unconditional grace. Verse 15 reads, But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. The covenant that God had made previously through Moses on Mount Sinai tied the blessings to the obedience of the commands. In Exodus 19, we read, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possessions. This new promise of God to David and all those that follow him is for unconditional grace. Now, God promised unconditional love, not unconditional approval. <coughs> When people become lost in iniquity, they will still feel the pain of human inflicted blows. But God will never again be separated from the steadfast love. No matter what we do, no matter what happens to us, God will never leave us or take love from us. No matter what, we will always be loved and cared for by God. No matter what. What? The rest of 2 Samuel 7 describes what David, how David responded to God's no. Because it's unconditional love, not unconditional approval. God said no to David's building plans. Verse 18, King David went in and sat before the Lord. Author Eugene Peterson says this might be the single most critical act that David ever did. The action that took him out of action. More critical than killing Goliath. More important than bringing the ark to Jerusalem. More critical because what David does in response to Nathan's pastoral prophetic counsel will either qualify or disqualify him from the rest of the kingdom work for which he has been anointed and trained and empowered. David, this man of action, could have chosen to force his will on others, not unlike the neighboring kings of Egypt and Syria, and instead he chose to humbly sit before God the king and pray. And his prayer indicates that he heard God's message to Nathan before David was full of himself. And now his focus is fully on God. Listen to these words from verse 22. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you as we have heard with our own ears. Peterson says modern Christians are characteristically much afraid of being caught doing too little for God, let alone nothing. But David's sitting is very purposeful. It's pregnant. It's a strategic time of inaction, a time for listening. We continue to build for God's kingdom. We, 
don't only build with bricks and mortar, we also build our whole congregation. We build programs like Vacation Bible School so that we can reach out into our community and teach our children. We help people grow stronger through small group studies and Bible studies. We fight hunger and we offer hope and healing through our ministries like our prayer shawl ministry. God works through us both globally and locally so that others can experience the mercy and the justice of God's kingdom. The Baltimore-Washington Conference has a unique relationship with the old Mutar Hospital in Zimbabwe. And so there we are building both a new water purification system and a new sewage system. And locally, we we're going to give a boy and a girl in Severn Elementary and Ridgeway Elementary backpacks full of school supplies. Both Delmont United Methodist Church and Severn United Methodist Church have exciting plans to build relationships, to build up the body of Christ towards God's kingdom. But how do we know that these are God's plans for us? by spending time with God. As hard as it is to stop and listen, we have to do it. We have to spend time in prayer, not only asking God for what we want, but also quiet time so that we can listen. And we work together in committees and councils so that we hear each other's voice. Because alone, any one of us could follow our good intentions, currently doing good, but not necessarily the good that God wants us to do. Together, we have a better chance of getting it right. Now, there's no fear that time spent before God in prayer is wasted. There's no danger in doing nothing. Or, or that will end up with nothing to do. David did much before he sat down, and he did much afterwards. Christian life is gloriously active as the Holy Spirit does the work of Christ in us and through us. But there's a danger of being so caught up in working for God that we forget about God. When we are wrong, we usually discover that right away and repent and get back on track. But when we do good, we can become pleased with ourselves and enjoy the combinations that others offer us and lose our sense of dependence on God and forget to listen to God's plan for God's grace. We are a people who like to build. Let us also be a people who are willing to listen to God, willing to hear God's voice through others, so that through us, God can build God's kingdom. Amen.